Okay, thank you, uh, Nikolai, for the invitation for, to speak about uh, some of the interesting um, receptor and lichen analysis we have done in the glucagon receptor and glucagon. So, um, my talk will be about uh, GPCRs, so that's my focus. Just to see if I can find a pointer. Someone help me with a pointer. Wonderful. Yes. So, uh, so what we're going to see today is, uh, is some uh, analysis we have done, looking into different uh, data data banks on the uh, on the uh, sequences of the glucagon receptor and the glucagon gene. Um, and we're also going to show you some data on on the molecular pharmacological phenotypes of of these receptor variants. Uh, and, and the reason for why I'm doing this is I'm, I'm driven by the, by, by, by the possibilities to make new drugs for GPCRs. So I come from the GPCR field and, and the family we're going to focus on today is of course the glucagon receptor. But I'm going to, I'm going to compare the glucagon receptor with the GLP-1, GLP-2 and the GIP receptor. Because I think there's some important differences that might be also important for why the glucagon system is so conserved that I will end up with in the conclusion. So let's take it, uh, there hasn't been so much about receptor activation in this meeting, so I'm going to just take it from a very uh, oh, a brief overview of the system here. But, but the way these uh, receptors, class B1 receptors, are activated is that they have this uh, large N-terminus that is capturing the C-terminal part of the ligands, and that positions the ligand N-terminus with the ability to dock into the binding pocket. I know that we know much more now, and some of you may also know that already. So, so I just brought some of the newer structures of the glucagon receptor, where we know a lot about how the glucagon, and particularly the, the stalk region and the extracellular parts, are important for the binding of glucagon. But glucagon is one of the main ligands for the glucagon receptor. It also binds oxyntomodulin, as you know, I'm not going into the secretion and the physiology because we now know everything or we know everything we know up to now after this meeting. But I want to focus on, for a start, the signaling of the glucagon receptor. And some of the things I want to emphasize is, is that it's, of course, strong in GS, as, as you might know, but it also has a very strong arresting recruitment, like the GLP-1 receptor, and it, it has this very weak internalization, which is opposite of the GLP-1 receptor. So if we go to the basic properties of these class B1 receptors, we see that we know that they are all GS coupled, and it, it pops up that some of them might also be GQ and GI coupled to a certain extent. The arresting recruitment is also something we learn a lot about these days. This is a normal thing which is important for desensitization and internalization, and also for signaling by its own. Uh, but that is very different within this family. So let's look at the G proteins from a start, comparing those four receptors that, that are uh, the one I want to focus on today. They are all GS coupled very strongly. And if we look at their potencies, we are most often in the two-digit picomolar range. That means really, really high potency. And uh, now there are some um, uh, reports about GQ coupling, for instance, for the GLP-1 receptor, which could be important during type 2 diabetes. There's also some crystal structures showing the eye coupling of the glucagon 1 receptor, but we don't know what that means. So, strong GS coupled. But when it comes to arresting, so this is the data I present here is from a bystander assay. It's very technical, but the most important thing is that the receptor is not labeled, so we can measure direct the arresting recruitment to, to the membrane uh, by, by having a fluorescently tagged membrane anchor. But what you see here is that the glucagon receptor is by far the most efficacious arresting recruiter of those two if we look at beta arresting one recruitment. And if we look at beta arresting two recruitment, we see the same. It's really, really efficacious uh, compared to uh, GLP-1 and GLP-2 and the GIP receptor. Um, so, and also I just want to emphasize that we are now in the nanomolar range. So we have moved away from very high potent cyclic AMP accumulation to a more low potent arresting recruitment. So what is regulating this arresting recruitment? So the, the GERCs, the G protein receptor kinases, uh, they, they, are, they are important for the initial phosphorylation. And what you see here is that if we co-express more of the GERCs, we see an inhibition of the glucagon receptor we see somehow increased uh, signaling from the GLP-1 receptor. And if we zoom in on GIP and GLP-2, because they are really low in their ability to recruit arrestins, we see that they are both getting better if we overexpress with, um, with the GERCs. So, not to go into all the details, but just to emphasize that they are different, very different when it comes to their ability to recruit arrestins and the regulation of that. 
But the arrest then is important for internalization and desensitization, as you know. So how is the glucagon receptor then internalized? Well, some of you do know that, but I just want to bring it up again. It has been published a long time ago. But it's very, very weak in its internalization. We need up to, as you can see here, one micromolar to get any kind of internalization using this snap tracked assay where we can follow the receptor uh, internalization in, in, in real time. If we compare that with the GLP-1 receptor, that is really, really strong. So uh, at 0.1 nanomolar, we see almost full internalization. So it's really strong, much stronger than the glucagon receptor. The GLP-2 is somehow weaker, but still OK. And the GIP is, is uh, also quite weak and in its uh, internalization properties. So again, you see that they might be similar, but they are very different in, in their receptor internalization, those four receptors. So Let's focus on the glucagon receptor and the variance in, in that receptor and what that means. So the first study that we did was to look into the GNOMAT database and found here 250 variants in 185 positions. And that was too much for the master student to analyze. So I asked him to go and, and, and pick some of them. And, and what he selected was then uh, 20 variants that were um, uh, potentially important for the glucagon binding. And also uh, he picked 18 variants that has either been explained before or described before or was uh, known um, as being important for some of the signaling properties. So what we did was to characterize them in cyclic MP accumulation, arrest and recruitment, and in some of them we did binding. And then we looked into uh, the databases, uh, UK Biobank and GNOMAD, to find whether there was any phenotypic implications of these variants. So here you see the results. Uh, it's uh, complicated, uh, you could say, but what you should notice is that there's a huge among a group of them, 23, uh, that has wild-type-like properties in cyclic EMP and the arrest in one and two rec recruitment. Some of them are affected in one pathway or in two pathways, and some are even affected in all three pathways. At that time, we were so focused on the cytic AMP that we, we, we chose to, to take that as, as the uh, selection criteria for, for the further, further analysis. So if we look at those variants with, with impaired arrest in, uh, sorry, cyclic MP recruitment, you can see that they, were, uh, they had different kind of uh, variation here. This is cyclic MP. Some of them were also, or most of them were also affected in the arrest and recruitment. But what you should really pay attention to is that their maximum binding, Bmax, this is homologous binding with, a, with an iodinated glucagon, it's really impaired. So these ones are, are, are probably poorly expressed on the surface before, because if we look at their affinity, it's maintained. So glucagon binds well, but there's just very little binding, so there's little on the surface. So going into some structural gymnastics, which we also like to do, we were trying to see if there's an overlap between the variants that are only affecting cyclic AMP and the ones only affecting arrestins, and that's something to do with bias in the system. And the conclusion is that we couldn't find any obvious structural explanation for these different um, um, selective impairment of the signaling. So our conclusion from that was that the expression was the only really thing, and that was probably very important. So going into the databases, we started with uh, 200,000 exomes, and then we had to do some analysis. I, I didn't do that. We have, uh, we have a, I'm collaborating with bioinformatics that can do all this. But ending up with 1,000 uh, exomes that could be used for the comparison and, and burden test on those ones. So what you see here is that the variants in orange, they are the one with loss of function in cyclic AMP and the variants in gray, they are the ones with a wild type like property in our, in our analysis. And the stippled line here in the middle, that's the wild type background. So what you see is that the, pheno the phenotypes of the ones that did not turn out to have any pheno um, changes in our signaling, they are like the background population. But the orange, the ones with loss of function in cyclic MP, they turned out to have a, a tendency for a higher body mass index, higher fat percentage an increase in the diastolic and, and uh, systolic blood pressure, and maybe also a tendency for, for diabetes. I would say that the statistics or the genetics, they are not so impressed about the statistics, but, but uh, I mean, that, that you can see the color somehow uh, count for itself. But looking into the literature, there's lots of um, information about some of these variants. Some of them are frequent and some of them are seldom. These ones are all characterized before as being important uh, with a phenotype in mice or in humans. 
But this one is interesting because this one turned out, if we just summarize in on the data, to be normal in cyclic MP, but being impaired in the resting recruitment. And it's actually quite all, um, uh, frequent, this variant here. So apparently there's a, there's a phenotypic uh, uh, alterations of, of having a, a, a variant with normal cyclic MP, but impaired arrestant. So that got us to focus on the arrestant recruitment. And I want to remind you again, it is really, really strong for the, for the glucagon receptor. So what does that mean then? So the glucagon receptor has the strong arrestant recruitment, meaning that it has a possibility for a fast desensitization, a fast signal and a fast stop of the signal. And we know that the arrestin is mainly interacting with the C terminus of the receptor as the first interaction point. We also know more about core areas, but let's focus on the C terminus. We went back to our variants and I had another uh, master student. I asked her to, to look at the C terminal variants and to do the analysis of, of how frequent are they and what do they mean. So she picked, uh, there was 25 missent variants in 19 uh, um, positions. And the first analysis you can see is that they have the same frequency in the C terminus than in the rest of the glucagon receptor. In terms of their binding, it's not surprising that they all bind glucagon quite well because they are all positioned far away from the binding site. So that was, uh, that was uh, uh, expected, you could say. You should notice that one of the variants had, had a surprisingly higher affinity, and that is sitting in, in the C-terminus, also with a potential phosphorylation site, it's a threonin. Now, looking into the cyclic AMP, we saw uh, a surprising impact on the cyclic AMP uh, of, of uh, most of them, and here I have simply ordered them in, in their ability to activate the receptor up to um, up to 100 picomolar because that's what we decided would be the highest physiological range. So they are actually quite affected in cyclic AMP. And also the one I pointed out before with the high affinity. But it's not in the potency, it's not the ability for, for the binding transition into signaling, it, it's more the overall uh, maximum efficiency of the signaling that is wrong because the potency is, is quite preserved. Now looking into the arrested recruitment, because that was what we really wanted to see for these variants, you can see that they are quite good in arrest and recruitment, except for one of them, which was this phosphorylation site that actually turned out to be right by quite bad in it. And again, just notice that we are in another range compared to the physiological levels of glucagon. And if we look at the, uh, the, the EC50, you know, the potency in the ability to recruit arrestment, they are all really, really good. So, Glucagon binds well, but it's the maximum ability of, of a rec recruiting that is lost in, in this variant here. So if I want to combine all this, looking at the maximum binding ability, because as, as I said, the affinity of glucagon is, is preserved. So if we look at the Bmax, this is how we calculate Bmax, it's how much is binding glucagon. You can see there's a very good correlation between how much glucagon binding we have and the overall signaling capaci capacity in um, cyclic MP here measured as area under the curve. So that means again that the expression is really, really central for, 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 for the uh, ability to signal and also for the phenotype. So we went back, I had another student and I asked her, this is the GIP, she also did it for the other ones, but I asked her to do a very careful titration of receptor expression and, and, and um, signaling outcome. And this is what you see, increasing amount of receptors gives increasing Bmax. This is the GIP, but that, that was the one she, she finished first. But she also did it for the glucagon. No main changes in the GIP levels. But if you look at the cyclic AMP, we see a huge difference in, in the ones with very low expression in, in, in our ability to measure cyclic AMP. But that also means that, that and, and you can see it's also translated into differences in their potency. Potencies. So the expression level is actually really what changes and what makes our changes for these uh, glucagon receptor variants. So going back to the variants in the C-terminal tail, it wasn't a big change except for this um, uh, in the affinity, but there were some changes in cyclic MP. If we compare, now we look at, uh, at um, again, everything we could find in the UK Biobank. And what you see is that the C-terminal tail variants that I presented before, we included again, they come out as being relevant for, for different uh, uh, metabolic traits. Um, whereas the C-terminal tail variants, there are actually no differences. That's, a, that's the green one in the middle and the black ones are the, are the background, uh, background wild type. What we do see in the, in the cardiometabolic um, variants, there could be a slight increase in the systolic blood pressure for 
uh, for these variants with, with the um, affected C-terminal cells. So overall, uh, we do not see that many phenotypic consequences of loss of function in heterozygous carriers of the glucagon receptor. But looking into other receptors, I mean, they are all interesting, these receptors. So here we compare the amount of receptor variance compared to what we would expect from, from the overall uh, background uh, sequence length and stuff like that. And you can see glucagon, comes out, glucagon receptor comes out as very, very low. The GIP comes out as very high. If we compare it with the allele, uh, the, the number of alleles, uh, the allele frequency compared to uh, for every position, we also see that the glucagon comes out very, very low. Uh, and if we compare it to the known disease mutations, we also see that the glucagon comes out very low, the glucagon receptor. This means that this receptor is very, very preserved. Now, what happens with the DIP receptor? That's up here. That is interesting. So we went into, just want to show you briefly our data on the DIP receptors, because there we see huge phenotypic changes. So what we did, this is uh, one that was published while we were also doing these studies and we were very happy for this because it's good that other people see the same as we do. Um, so here you see heterozygous carriers of one mutant and another mutant and together carrying those two, you have an 11 kilo loss of weight. So we looked into those mutants in the, in the lab and, and we saw that these two mutants are severely impaired in their cyclic MP formation and also in, in arrestin recruitment. So they are impaired, they are loss of function at the molecular level. We also did the UK Biobank analysis and we saw the same uh, now with including much more people and, and a statistical significance for all the adipositive um, related traits that they all come out as, as being relevant for these people in the GIP system. And also with some changes in the cardiometabolic field uh, with, with bone and, and uh, uh, and also blood pressure. So, so this, these are the, the, uh, the organ systems that are infected in, in the GIP. Briefly, we went back to a Danish cohort and isolated 47 SNPs that were identified in, in the diabetes cohort, cohorts in Denmark. And we analyzed these in cyclic MP, and what you can see many of these are actually <coughs> quite impaired in cyclic MP when it comes to their signaling at 100 picomolar. And if we do a complete cluster analysis, this is a lot of work comprised into one figure. What you can see here, we look at, at the binding and the cyclic AMP and the overall arrest and recruitment. We have a huge uh, bunch of variants that are wild type like. We have some variants that are loss of function, of course, in cyclic AMP. But then we have an interesting group of arresting biased variants that are loss of function in cyclic AMP, but they have their maintained arrest and recruitment. So how does that come out in, in the, the UK Biobank? Well, all the wild type liked, they had no difference from the background population in all these different traits that I, I will show you here. No change in the diseases and no change in these uh, cardiometabolic traits. But if we look at our loss of function in the GIP receptor, that's the purple ones up here, the purple, 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 they comes, come out as, as being severely impaired with all these traits, like the other two mutants I showed you before and also predicted loss of function in all variants in the UK Biobank, they come up the same way. But interestingly, you should notice this little group up here, which is, uh, was, was the arresting bias that was loss of function in cyclic MP, but will, um, will arrest in, uh, maintain the arresting recruitment. And they, whoops, and they have no phenotypic changes. So the arrest in recruitment seems to, make, to, to rescue the loss of cyclic MP, pointing towards arrest in recruitment as being extremely important for these receptors and not only cyclic MP for their overall function. So there's clearly in the DIP system much stronger phenotypic changes than in the glucagon uh, receptor. What about the glucagon derived peptides? Then we looked into the pro-glucagon, uh, uh, the whole gene, and we uh, looked into three different databases. We identified 35 of uh, 184 uh, unique missense variants that were present in all, all three of them, and some were present in, in two, and some were only present in one of the cohorts. Um, so how are these positioned, and how are they predicted deleteriousness. Now that's what I'm going to show you here. This is a very busy slide, but what we show here is the, 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 the allele frequency together with the predicted deleteriousness. And now I'm going to separate those two. It's easier to look at. So the blue curve is the conservation score 
if you have a, a low in end here, you have a high degree of conservation. And if what you see, which is maybe not ex unexpected, but uh, it, nevertheless, it's very interesting that the glucagon peptide, the DLP1 peptide, and the DLP2 peptides, they are more conserved than the intersectional peptides or, or part of the gene. And if we look at the uh, uh, predicted deleter deleteriousness, we use two different algorithms, the CAT score here, and, and this uh, new, it was a, a more new algorithm here, the primate A. AI algorithm, uh, but they are both agreeing on that you have a higher deleteriousness of the variants in, within the peptides <laughs> compared to the regions between. And if we do another analysis uh, where we look at the each, of the each of the variants and, and their conservation degree, you can see that again that the peptides are more conserved than the other sections. And if we focus on glucagon, which is what we do today and yesterday, glucagon, compared to the other peptides, the glucagon uh, peptide, the glucagon hormone is more conserved than, than the other ones. So it's more conserved than DLP1 and DLP2. If we look at the predicted deleteriousness again, uh, you can see uh, for each of the positions we have uh, more deleteriousness for, 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 for the three peptides. But again, comparing them, glucagon seems to be the most dangerous one to have a variant in for these predicted algorithms. So going into a bit of structure function, I'm not going to do a lot. It's just to say that we haven't done the in vitro analysis yet, so I had to present something else for you. So what you see here is the predicted loss of binding affinity for each of the positions in the glucagon gene over here. So if something goes up, we, have a, a, we need more energy to bind, and that means we predict that we have a lower binding affinity. And we are going to find out. But that was correlated very well with, with some known data on binding affinities and also correlated well with the CAT score. And you can see the same, same data for GLP-1, which is not the focus. So, to sum up of what I showed you today, which is quite different from what you have heard for the rest of the meeting, is that focusing on the glucagon receptor, the wild type receptor is really strong in TS, which, which you know from that family, strong arresting recruitment, which is very important for the function of it, uh, and then it has this very weak internalization. I presented multiple SNPs, uh, and that was scattered all over the receptor, but very often they were not really uh, leading to any phenotype. And, and, and they are fewer compared to the related receptors, and for instance, compared to the GIP receptor that I, I showed you. It seems like there are some loss of function uh, uh, that could be related to the cardiometabolic traits, but that is both the cyclic AMP and the arresting recruitment that is important here. So I want to put arresting recruitment on the, on the, on, on the uh, landscape here again for being important for this overall function, and not only for desensitization and stop of the signal. So for the glucagon gene, I showed you that there is a higher conservation in the derived peptide compared to the intersecting parts. And also that the glucagon is the most conserved of all the peptides from, that, uh, from the proglucagon gene. I also showed that, that there's a higher um, deleteriousness within the peptides compared to the uh, intersectional part. But again, that the glucagon is, is most deleterious uh, compared to the other peptides from the same gene, um, proglucagon gene. So these are the people that have done some of the work, uh, and, and I put in many collaborators uh, through many years, uh, also collaborating with some, some of the people being here. But the genetics was mainly done by Alexander Hauser. He's a bioinformatics with a focus on doing these uh, genetic analysis. So we have teamed on, 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 on me on the, you could say, medical clinical translational side and, and him with the, um, with the bioinformatic analysis. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, we'll open up for questions. Thank you, everyone, for talk. Um, I'm very curious about the GI coupling to the glucagon receptor, and uh, what seconds do you think that will be activated? Um, I, I don't know. It, it, it turned out to be quite strong from the uh, structure uh, published by, by, by the Shanghai group, Billy Wu, um, that there's a strong coupling. So they simply made a, 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 a crystal structure of the glucagon receptor with GI. Um, I don't know about any, any physiological relevance of it. I don't think it's really established what it can do, but it can do it. GI is also abundant compared to GS, so it could be um, 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 
I mean, it, it, it is likely that, it, that many receptors are able to couple a little bit to GI, but whether that means anything, I don't know in this case. But for the GLP-1 receptor, the DQ coupling has been proposed to do something under certain, um, for instance, in, during a type 2 diabetes in the, B in the beta cell. But we don't know for the glucagon receptor. But it will be interesting to find out. <laughs> That's really interesting. So I was interested to see your GIP receptor data. So you show quite clearly that the GIP receptor doesn't couple very well to arrestin, yeah. yet you say that it seems to be really important for controlling some of the arrestin, yeah. some of the GIP yeah. uh, receptor variant effects. So how do you rationalize those two things? It's a very good question. Uh, you, the fact that it is not strong doesn't mean that it doesn't mean anything in physiology. I mean, because we have our systems where we express a certain amount of receptor, and then we measure what we can see in our artificial system. Something is really strong, something is weak, but th the weak doesn't mean that it doesn't have an impact in, 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 uh, in vivo so I, and in, in, in physiology. So I, I don't think we should translate that just because it's weak, it's not important, because our data show that it is important. It's just interesting from the overall comparison of these ones to see that, you know, isolated, they are different in their ability to signal in the, in the system that, that we are comparing them in. But of course, we should go into the beautiful systems that you have where we can look into the beta cell. I mean, the, the more physiological relevant uh, settings. Hi, Matt, a really, really nice presentation. Just um, a, a slightly different question, but RAMP, we've previously shown RAMP2 to be associated with the glucagon receptor leading to uh, increased internalization, so less recycling of the receptor. Have you looked at this in, in terms of all these mut mutants? No, I have not looked at it. Um, would be cool <laughs> to it do. It might be interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Another? Um, yeah, that was a great presentation. Um, again, uh, kind of focusing on the GIP receptor, uh, which was interesting that you... Sorry, you Nikolai. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, is it possible that this uh, enhanced beta arrestin recruitment is more relevant? I mean, in some papers, in, uh, not all of them, they have shown that the GIP receptor might be constitu constitutively active. Um, and perhaps this increased beta arrestin recruitment is more affecting the constitutive activity rather than the ligand-induced activity. Is this possible? I mean, it, it, is a, it is a way to keep the receptor uh, away from the G proteins, you could say, that you have a rest in recruitment. So it, it's, it's possible that the balance could be important. Uh, but, but the GIP receptor is, um, is, a, is, is very strong. It's right that it has constitutive activity. For instance, when we try to make stably transfected cells, or still stably expressing cells, they simply die if they have too high chip receptor expression, just from the basal, just from having the chip receptor there, whereas they survive fine with all the other in this family, but, but the chip receptor has something just by its presence. Um, may, may I ask one more question? Uh, if it's about glucagon, Nikolai, yeah, it's, right? It's on glucagon, <laughs> yeah, this time. Uh, no, it, it's uh, fine <laughs> for me. <laughs> uh, I, I, if, I'm, if you um, correct me if I'm wrong, but so early on the glucagon in this presentation, you, you showed that binding affinity or bind, like the, the bind Bmax was highly uh, uh, correlated with the degree of CAMP production and also, I think, beta arrestin recruitment. Um, do you, is it possible that a lot of or potential biased agonism that we see is just basically um, a, an artifact of just this bind, this kind of Bmax efficacy uh, that, that that you're seeing there? Is is are we kind of seeing an illusion with partial uh, with biased agonism that is just uh, described by this this effect? It, it's very possible that if you don't really look carefully into it that that you at certain receptor expression levels only see one signaling pathway and not the other so so uh, and you could say if you really over express receptors which is dangerous to do then you start seeing some some artificial uh, pathways also so so it's possible that bias signaling can be affected by the expression level and thereby uh, also difficult to interpretate um, 